Times. Um, I think it was like a week and a half ago, President Trump said that you were the better candidate than President Biden, and then a couple of days ago, he reversed course and said that uh, Democrats should vote for Biden over uh, you. Uh, why Why do you think President Trump has been ramping up his criticism? I think he sees that I'm a threat to his presidency. You talked during your speech about the question of recalling the Moderna vaccine and you laid out concerns you had about other COVID responses, but would you recall the Moderna vaccine? Like I said, the, the question that the press ought to be asking is, I think we have the worst record, the worst, highest body count of any nation in the world during COVID. Why aren't the public health agencies answering that question? Why do we have 16% of the COVID deaths we only have 4.2% of the world's population. We need the science done, and we need the, that answer made clear to the American people. And I would say it's massive media malpractice that journals like the Washington Post, which is in Washington, with reporters who are special, specialists in, at NIH, that they're not answering that question and forcing the agencies to explain themselves and make that explanation to the American public. Oh, that's what I would say. I'm going to look at all of the pandemic responses, and I'm going to make sure that we have adequate science, make good judgments on all Your of mate said that she would recall it. Do you agree with her? Next question. Um, as a result of the anti -Israel, of her handling of anti-Israel protests on Columbia campuses, some Congress people have called for the resignation of President Shafiq. Do you agree the, uh, with people calling for the resignation? Re Columbia President Shafiq, Congressman of the uh, uh, I don't know enough about it. Uh, Derek, we're up in the Times. On Ukraine, would you halt the flow of weapons from the U.S. to Ukraine? And would you? Uh, uh, listen, Pre I'm not going to tell you what my negotiating tactic would be. I'm going to go, my, I negotiate for a living. I've negotiated the hands to hundreds and hundreds of losses. You don't tell your opponent, your adversary, what your negotiating tactic is. President Putin has said repeatedly, including on Tucker, three weeks ago, that he wants to negotiate. President, when my uncle was president, he realized that his intelligence apparatus and his military brass simply wanted a war, and he therefore installed a hush on the Soviet Union and began a private correspondence with Russia. 26 letters they exchanged. My uncle had a phone on his desk that if he picked it up, Khrushchev would answer at the height of the Cold War. President Biden has never spoken to President Trump. President Zelensky has passed a law making it illegal in Ukraine to negotiate with President Putin. We ought to, and I said President, I meant President Putin before, we need to negotiate. President Putin has said he wants to negotiate. Let's sit down with him and work out something where we can stop killing people. Or would you let them keep the land they've captured? I, I'm not going to tell you what my negotiating position is going to be. That would be something I would negotiate, not that I'm going to reject in advance. Peter Nicolino, Radio Hofstra University, and students for Kennedy. What do you plan on doing to combat the student debt crisis in America? I'm going to do a number of things. One is, I'm going to make debt dischargeable in bankruptcy, like all other debts. There's no other debt that you can't discharge in bankruptcy. I'm going to make it so students can refinance their debt. It's insane that they're not able to refinance it. And there's a number of other things I'm going to do to reduce that burden. I, you know, I think it's uh, there's a whole generation of kids now that are um, that are dragging an economic anchor, and it is hurtful to our economy and the entrepreneurial spirit that we need to reinvigorate to restore this country. And so I'm going to deal directly with that. Go ahead. 
uh, George, thank you so much, Overseas Media. Uh, back to Russia, Ukraine. Do you find uh, Mr. Putin trustworthy? Because that's a concern of a lot of world leaders, that even if Putin negotiates, he will not do so in good faith. I've negotiated, I would say, over 500 settlements. There's not a single adversary that I've ever negotiated with who I trusted. You never negotiate, you never trust your adversary. That's what language art is for. That's what negotiation, that's what contracts are for. You, have, you, you, you create an agreement that allows you to distrust but to verify. Last question. Last question right here. You, you, you write consequences into it. That's like, that is the art of, of, of contract negotiation, which I'm an expert on. Okay, last question right here. Oh. So, uh, talking about, uh, my name is Lisa Kamen at RTVI. Uh, talking about uh, Russia again, uh, because like, we are actually a Russian language channel, but uh, kind of in opposition to the Kremlin right now. How would you build like relationship with Russia, the president, and other post-Soviet Union countries? Well, you know, George Kennan said it was the most important diplomat, probably at least in modern American history, it was the architect of the containment policy after World War II. And he said that the worst thing that we could do after 1992, when the Soviet Union was dismantled, was to continue to treat Russia as an enemy. And yet we did it. Bill Pierce, who is now the head of the CIA, said the same thing. Bill Perry, who was then the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, threatened to resign from the Clinton cabinet if we, if we went through with our threat to move NATO to the east. We promised Gorbachev in 1992 we would not move NATO one inch to the east. We moved it into 14 countries, a thousand miles to the east. We put nuclear weapons ready systems, Aegis missile systems in Poland and Romania, and 12 minutes from the Kremlin. We could decapitate the entire Soviet leader or Russian leadership within 12 minutes. They obviously don't want the same thing in Poland and Ukraine. Russia has been invaded three times through Ukraine. The last time, Hitler killed one out of every seven Russians. So they have legitimate security interest in making sure the U.S. is not running Ukraine, that Ukraine is a neutral country. This is the same worries that prompted my uncle to force the Russians to remove missiles from Cuba in 1962. And he realized during that conflict the reason Khrushchev put the missiles in Cuba was because we had put Jupiter missiles in Turkey. And he made a secret agreement with Ambassador Bill Brennan and uh, President Orban, or Khrushchev at that time, that we would remove the missiles from Turkey. So we've always recognized since my uncle's time that the Russians have a legitimate interest in not having nuclear-ready missile systems on their border. Oh, I think we have to have a little bit of humility. My uncle always said, if you want peace, you have to put yourself, you have to put yourself in your adversary's shoes. And we need to start doing that in Washington. They're not, we're not doing, we have the neocons there who are running our government now with a vision of U.S. heading on all over the world. And we live in a multipolar world today. We have to be, oh, we have to start getting along with people. And, uh, and not making them into enemies automatically. Great, thank you. One more question, please. My name is Yvette. Oh, don't be.